It's a joy to recall my great teachers. I've had so many wonderful teachers. The first that stands out in my mind was my cello teacher. I spent a year in his master class when I was 20 years old, took a year off from college to study with him. His name was Gregor Piatigorsky. He was a great old Russian cellist, one of the great musicians of the 20th century, and I was uh, privileged and honored to be in his class for a year. He had seven people from around the world, seven cellists. I would say that one of the great lessons I had from Piatigorsky, I'll give you two, was first of all, he taught music through stories. He would teach for five hours at a time, and uh, all, all of the cellists were quite, uh, quite technically proficient. They had mastered a great deal of the craft of cello playing. Perhaps I was the least proficient of all the cellists from a, from a technical point of view. His focus was not on the technical mastery of, of the instrument. His focus was on being a musician. And to teach being a musician, he had to teach trying to understand the spirit and the soul of the phrase. W what phrase meant what emotionally, in what way? What direction should the phrase move? And in order to do that, he would teach through stories. He would all of a sudden stop the cellist in the middle of a, of a piece of music, and he'd launch into a story hoping that the story as a metaphor would somehow awaken and illuminate the meaning of that musical phrase. I'll give you one example. He uh, stopped the cellist at one point and he began to describe how the big breakthrough in his career uh, uh, was uh, as a uh, first chair cellist in the Berlin Symphony in the, 19, in the 1920s and uh, how he ached to become a soloist a, uh, which he did become one of the great virtuoso soloists of his generation. But at that time he was in the orchestra and he needed somehow to break out. Well, he realized that the great conductor, Furchtbangler, was going to be conducting. And uh, a piece of music uh, by Strauss that had a one-note cello solo. And he described then practicing over and over again this one note, trying to make this one note as rich and meaningful and alive and present as he could. And finally the night of the concert came, he played that note, he got noticed for that one note, and that launched his career. Now I don't know for sure if actually that story was totally true in terms of facts, but his, his intent wasn't necessarily to tell a historical factual story, it was to try to provide provide meaning, a truth in the sense of a deeper meaning. And the meaning he was trying to convey to the students was to make each note count. Don't let any note go by without its note having meaning and having its own presence, even if it's a very fast note in a phrase. Well, so that's how he taught. And from that point on, I began to realize, as I continued my education in my 20s and 30s, began to teach leadership here at the Kennedy School 35 years ago, that, there's, uh, that the most primal way, the primary way people have always learned is by sitting around the campfire and hearing stories, by sitting over somebody else's shoulder and, and seeing the story of their, own, uh, of their own work as an apprentice and that storytelling was therefore one of the major and key modes of trying to communicate and trying to transmit complex behavioral uh, practice. A second great professor was Ernst Nagel. Uh, when I was a student at Columbia University, Ernst Nagel was one of the great philosophers of science. And I remember going to his office hours and asking him before graduation, uh, I said, Professor Nagel, Professor Nagel, tell me, what kinds of questions do you work on? I had realized by the end of college that that question itself was sort of a master key kind of question, to ask people, what kinds of questions do you ask? What kinds of questions do you work on? And he, his eyes lit up when I asked him that question, and he immediately said, well, I'm working on the question, what can be measured? And to what uses measurement uh, can be applied? And where does measurement become limited? And I said to him, oh, in the same way that Juliet says to Romeo, or perhaps it's Romeo says to Juliet, I, I forget, in Shakespeare, I give you all my love, and yet I have more. 
Some things in life can't be measured. Some things are beyond measure. And in a world where, certainly a professional world where everything is measured, to realize that turning the lights on behind one child's eyes cannot be measured is a very important gift. Some of us spend our whole lives calibrating the worth of our lives according to some metric when ultimately good cannot be measured. Ernst Nagel, a philosopher of science, first taught me that lesson.